Good morning, everyone. I am Brenda Shelton Dunstan. I am on the steering committee, and I'm the executive director of the Black Women's Health Alliance in Philadelphia. This morning, I will be introducing Sandra Zellman Lewis, uh, who is our first speaker for this panel. She is a health service researcher and evidence-based clinical practice guidelines developer. As chief guidelines officer of Dr. Evidence, she oversees the growth program and all guideline-related projects and products. She is also president of EBQ Consulting for Guideline and Quality Improvement Consulting. Previously, Dr. Lewis directed the development and implementation of evidence-based clinical practice guidelines and clinical statements at the American College of Chest Physicians and helped to establish the ACCP Quality Improvement Committee and related QI initiatives. In that role, she helped develop the process and training for consumers to participate on several guideline panels. She created and co-taught the ACCP Guidelines Methodology course, a two-day interactive course on evidence-based medicine, which included incorporation of consumers on guideline panels. Dr. Lewis is the immediate past chair of the Guidelines International Network North America and continues to serve on the planning committee for the evidence-based guidelines affecting policy, practice, and stakeholders, EGAPS 3 conference. In addition to previous EGAPS conferences and hosted the Guidelines International Network's first U.S. conference in 2010. She also serves on the Methods Committee of the Kidney Disease International Guidelines Organization the American Academy of Pediatrics Institutional Review Board reviewed grant applications for the Patient Centers Outcomes Research Institute and serves as a peer reviewer for several medical and health journals. Dr. Lewis has published more than 20 peer reviewed articles on guideline methodology and EBM. She has been an, an invited presenter at the Institute of Medicine multiple times, faculty in several EBM courses and webinars, and presented her work in developing the Living Guidelines Model, Trustworthy Consensus Statements, Conflict of Interest Policies, Anti-Tobacco Advocacy and Technology Platforms for Evidence Curation and Analysis among other topics at professional conferences in the U.S., U.K., South Korea, Portugal, the Netherlands, and Romania. Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Brenda. I really appreciate that. I think we used up my five minutes, but... <laughs> uh, so... I am a clinical practice guideline developer. I am not currently engaged in doing the, um, the actual development of guidelines, although I do do consulting to people who are doing, doing guideline development today. So I, um, for this presentation, I decided to go back and survey some of my fellow colleagues who are actually engaged in doing guideline development today. And so I want to share with you the results of this very non-systematic survey, but I'm going to give you just the highlights today. On Tuesday, for any of you who are staying for the EGAPS conference, you'll get the full presentation. But there were six North American organizations and three international organizations that I surveyed, got a 100% response rate. Can't, can't usually say that, so it feels good to say it when I can. So where did these organizations find their consumers? They found them at Q, primarily, uh, from self-health groups and from ag advocacy groups. And there's one of the comments you can read. But the question is, did consumers meaningfully contribute, meaningfully contribute in a way that, that actually made a difference? And so the answer is, the bottom line is yes, consumers made a positive difference. And here's all the different ways 
that were listed in the um, survey results. So they helped with guideline um, question development. The clinical questions that are asked that later become PICO questions or PCOTS questions, that, that is really an important place for consumers to put, uh, put in their, their feedback early on. It, it will steer the whole ship one way or another. So very, very important they do that. And also they explained how patients perceive certain outcomes. This was meaningful too. They also impact the recommendations, oftentimes changing the wording of the recommendation, sometimes rewording it, sometimes explaining the, um, the words that were used by the clinicians who drafted those recommendations would be misinterpreted by patients and consumers. And so the panels go, oh, no, no, that's not what we meant. So then the patients and consumers made a huge difference by helping them to understand how those words would be interpreted and helping them to rewrite it. Also for um, advocating for things like palliative care, uh, survival, survivorship issues. These, these are issues that were not necessarily being brought up by the clinician panelists, but the consumer panelists were bringing it up. They helped them to focus on costs. Sometimes the clinician panelists try to avoid costs but it's harder and harder today to do that, and we're actually recommending that they don't avoid it anymore, right? They should include it, but it's, a, it's harder to do because we don't have a lot of cost-benefit analyses in most of the areas where we're writing guidelines. So it's, it's a difficult area to be in, but consumers still want it addressed, and rightfully so. And then they actually helped in drafting public summaries, plain language summaries. The difference between those two is the first is the version that's going to go out for peer review or public review. The second is the summary that's um, like a final derivative product of the, of the final version of the guidelines. And that will go out, you know, very, you know, globally to uh, patients, to providers so they can share it with patients so that they can help to, to facilitate a well-informed, shared clinical decision-making conversation. And decision aids, of course, so sometimes they're more like a tool rather than a plain language summary. Uh, guides to help with that interaction. Uh, patient education materials, including frequently asked questions, performance measures, and quality indicators. So, so the consumers are playing a big role, and they are making an impact. Now, the question is, what is their impact on the panelists, okay? What, what is the impact of the consumers on the panelists? So actually, I thought that was a very interesting question to answer, and I got very interesting responses. In general, the panelists were open and welcoming to the consumers. There is one negative experience I'll talk about on Tuesday, but it was, there was only one reported in all of these. And you have to understand, not only were there nine organizations, but, but many of these organizations were reporting on multiple guideline panel experiences. One said they had hundreds. Um, the language and behavior of the clinical people became more respectful and less adversarial when consumers were present. And the staffers were aware of this. They were, they were actually noticing this. They also asked questions of the consumers about the fears they might have the treat, you know, regarding the treatments or regarding the course of the disease and how they, would, um, how they would feel about certain treatment options or certain care management um, processes. They're aware that there was an awareness that the recommendations and the summary documents should include supplementary information that originally the professionals didn't even think about. They weren't planning on including. So the consumers were actually impacting the work of the guideline panelists who were not consumers in a very positive way. And I have more to present on Tuesday for those of you who are coming to EGAPS. But do I have any questions for now, or are we going to hold those till later? Till later. Till later. Okay. Thank you all.